All right, so here we are tonight. We are coming with the glory of the Lord as His Word is coming tonight. And the glory of the Lord is upon us. And so we're excited as we are in the 16th day of the 12th month of the year 2020. So a season of harvest, one of elevation. And as we get ready to close out this door, uh, 14 more days, right? Well, make me, let me check, make sure that I... Sorry, 15 more days. But closer to 14 since this one is almost over. So, um, two weeks left. There we go. Two weeks left in this month. Um, and so all the fulfillment, all the promises that God has laid upon and bestowed upon you, I just ask that you reach out um, and grab what you can from the Word tonight. Uh, because the Word is set out to equip, empower, and encourage us. It is our... It is our um, our roadmap that we use, right? It Did is you our, know it, your it is our the same roadmap, level? and it is our light. It is our glory. We use it um, to get to where we need to. So, if the cross be our compass as Christians, right? And if the uh, if the Bible be our roadmap, and the Holy Spirit is that is that guide, is that voice uh, that you use on your GPSs uh, that will guide you here and there. Don't be like we are in the car, right? Don't be like we are in a car with the phone or the GPS and how we, um, how we have a tendency not to adhere to it, right? So the Word is here to guide, direct, to lead, to inspire, to convict, um, and the Holy Spirit is there to guide us in that, right? To take that Word, interpret it for us, and lead us. Uh, but we got to be willing vessels. So we like to as we come into the new year to make new year's resolutions but what i'm saying is is to make it a lifestyle make this word a lifestyle mm -hmm. to grow into it use it um, because it is freely given to you to to help to benefit you and help to benefit others so we're coming with the word tonight i'm excited um and we're going to pray and then we're going to go over a brief review and then we're going to get into uh some mighty verses that i believe god has in store for you um and in particular in this season, in this Advent season, as we row on and get ready to celebrate Christmas, right? I know a lot of people are excited for Christmas, nine days till Christmas, right? Fifteen days uh, until we close out this year. So a lot going on, even in the midst of what isn't going on with the, with the pandemic. But if we set our sights and focus on God and we encompass His Word, we take His Word and let it take over us and allow the Holy Spirit to move in us, right? Um then we will see that there are a lot of things, a lot of gifts, much more than what are just up underneath your tree, uh, that are coming and, and, and to continue to bless us, right? And if we just think about it, if we get no physical gift, the blood of Christ uh, has, has redeemed us, right? The shedding of that blood, and we'll continue to harp on that, right? Uh, the shedding of the blood redeems us. It's our faith in that blood, right? The faith, uh, grace by faith. Uh, that justifies us, to, to bring us back into that right standing, but ultimately God's grace, unmerited favor that allows us to be saved. And that's, that's a word of praise right there in and of itself. So if you're not gift wrapping anything else, you gift wrap the love of Christ, right, that is displayed to us on a habitual basis. That's why we like to say that the cross is our compass, right? It's our moral, it's our ethical, it's our spiritual uh, compass because without that we don't have righteousness of our own right and this word allows us to be guided um, and then we have a spiritual guide which is our Holy Spirit and the closer we get to God and the further away we move from this world uh, the more enabled we are to rejoice right he says the joy of the Lord is your strength he says be anxious for nothing why and, and but by prayer and supplication make all requests known to God and and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your heart. So, so that, that's just some inspiration of what we get from getting in the Word, right? From cover to cover, it's about His love. It's about His fidelity. Um, and, and I just get excited because if you're giving Christ in this season, and if you're giving His light in this season, right? If you're giving all those things um, and you're giving God the glory, remember, if we give Him the glory, He will bless us, right? He gets the glory, we get the blessings. It's not about us. And so when we realize that it's not about us, uh, we can walk a little bit more freely because He who gives us this day, this hour, this very moment, has given it to us with a task and a purpose, and His will should be done, 
just like he did with Jacob. He says, I'm not releasing my hand off of you uh, until what I have promised comes uh, to pass. That's me paraphrasing. Uh, but that was in the midst of Jacob being really booted out from, from his land, the land that God promised, right? And having to go off in the midst of him being in the desert. So some of us are in the wilderness, some of us are in the desert, in a dry place. Uh, but God's not going to let go of what he has promised to us. And that is the mark that we have by having the Holy Spirit uh, indwell into us, having the blood of Christ be transfused into us. So a lot of things that are for us, right? There are a lot of gifts that are for us, despite and in spite of what the world will tell you. So I hope you're excited. I'm excited. Uh, we've, we've got a, a pretty good word today. Um, and hopefully it'll plant a seed into you that is not just good enough for you, but it's so good that you got to go out and share it with somebody. If nothing else, you share and get in conversing uh, with the Lord in your directed study with Him as the Spirit goes rampant into you, uh, as you go into your prayer closet, um, and hopefully you're touching and agreeing with somebody that is in the faith and touching uh, somebody's life who, who doesn't know Christ. And so that's a full day. If you, if you take just a smidgen of God's Word uh, and, and repeat back to Him, uh, and, and, and give him some confirmation of what he has said, right? Bring back into remembrance. He says, bring me back into remembrance of what I have said. Uh, and if you allow his spirit to guide you and direct you in these things, you share it with the, with the saint, um, uh, you know, fellow believer, and then you go out and you present your body, a living sacrifice, and present that word out into the world, you have a pretty full day. So, so you can see what I mean by... God gets you up with a task and purpose, and so he's filling that word inside of you, so, so just excited about that. So as we go into prayer, I just ask that you allow his revelation um, to be with you tonight. So, so put away all the clutter, if you're like me, and, 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 and running from one place to another, um, and there never seems to be enough time, make time out for him. And I guarantee you, if you make time out for his word, um, the life you're saving is not just your own, right? Um, and so it'll, it'll, it'll be good. Um, so open up your heart today uh, and allow him to perform some heart surgery onto you. Allow him to, to patch up some things there and remove some blockage so that you can go out and be the chosen vessel. So why do I say all this? Well, because part of what the word is tonight is piggybacking off of what we've come across uh, the last two or three weeks and in particular last week and you'll see how we interconnect that. So go with me as we go into prayer and as we receive the blessings of the Lord. So, Heavenly Father, we glorify your name today, Father God. For you have gotten us up today, Father God, and you have birthed a wonderful thing into us, Father God. So we're giving you permission to touch our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and our souls, Father God, and to release from on high, from on heaven, Father God, onto this earth, which you have ordained from time to old, Father God. Make us your chosen vessels, Father God. Direct it and guide it, Father God, for a specific purpose, for a time such as this. Father God, embolden our hearts and, and equip our mouths to go forth and give you praise and glorify your name, Father God, so that a captives might be set free mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, and physically, Father God, that we might bring you glory, we might bring you honor, and we might praise your name, Father God, that your people might see a great light in and through us, Father God, in and through all of our imperfections, Father God, you have turned us to your righteousness and not of our own, Father God. So we glorify your holy name tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So as we come forth with the word tonight, we're in Exodus 3. And where we're going is, is Exodus 3, uh, verses 11 through 22. Okay, uh, We're going to do like we did last week. We're going to read through those and then we're going to bracket in um, and, and, and hopefully plant some seeds, plant some nuggets that you can chew on there uh, and go back and get some questions um, uh, that you can ask of the Lord, that you can ask to the ministerial staff, that you can do some research, but something that will cause you to grow in the Lord, to stand firm in the faith in this season, right? So what we've talked about over really the last three weeks, as we three, four weeks as we transition uh, out of Genesis into Exodus, we talked about um, 400 plus years, 430 years, um, had transpired since the end of Genesis 50 to Exodus 1, right? And that's significant as we see the transition um, from the one uh, to the few, right? The few, the proud, uh, to the many. And really, Exodus shows the birth of the nation of Israel, right? Uh, we start seeing that as we transition in Genesis 39, as Jacob 
goes forth and 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 um, and really it you see the transition from from Jacob um, to the sons and in particular Joseph and from there um, the interactions as he's he's put into bondage uh, his elevation and the subsequent uh, redemption of Israel aka Jacob uh, and we talked about the number 70 so 70 minus uh, the remnant of Joseph and his family that Pharaoh gave him uh, so about 70 folks come out of the land of Canaan the promised land into Egypt in the midst of the famine right um, and they began to prosper and they began to multiply all these things that God promised them right uh, through the seed of Abraham uh, start coming to fruition we start to see uh, in earnest as we turn to Exodus 1 but as we turn to Exodus 1 we start to see that things didn't really go quite according to the plan of man right 400 plus years passed uh, right wrong or indifferent their minds drifted they did some things um, uh, that probably were not uh, in line with God right so so for 400 plus years now uh, they began to separate from God now remember God chose Abraham on the heels of the depravity of mankind uh, be it either the incidents of Cain and Abel, be it the things that, that caused the flood, the Tower of Babel, all those things over a period of time. So he chose the one that he would build a mighty nation to call out uh, of this world that he could have be his own, right? Um, and you see that, that, that time might be of the essence of this flesh because as we come out the womb, there's expiration date. But for God, he spans time, right? So he's patient. He's the master chess player. He's aligning things all throughout. And as we talked about, the foundation being in Genesis and carrying all throughout the Pentateuch, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, right? And, and, and really throughout the rest of the Old Testament into the New Testament. But really, these five books show and lay that foundation. If you carefully are looking... Um, the road to redemption, the path to salvation, as he's calling his people onto him, right? And so we love to, to, to show that and then overlay how God fulfills it uh, through Jesus Christ. And so this is important, especially in this Christmas season, uh, this Advent season, uh, as we celebrate the oncoming uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Um, but he lays these seeds down, but he sees the oppression of his people, right? So Exodus chapter 1 talks about how uh, the previous lineage of Pharaoh had died off. And so they didn't remember the plight of Joseph and all the things he had done for Egypt, right? And so a couple of things that, that the nation of Israel had um, going against them, um, the offsprings of Jacob, the, the, the ones uh, that were associated with Joseph. What they no longer had going for them was the lineage and a remnant that remembered the actions of Joseph um, had gone by the wayside, right? Two, um, which was once a few people out um, in, 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 in Goshen, out in the desert, these shepherds, right, um, had now multiplied exceedingly and abundantly well as according to the promise of God. Remember, God's promises keep. They don't expire, right? Um, they span up the generations, and now... They were, they were in the hundreds of thousands, right? Uh, to the point where the new Pharaoh uh, began to fear them. He began to fear them in that he feared that they might rebel against him. So he enslaved them uh, that they might work for him and might build his kingdom. Um, and so when that didn't work, uh, he began to, to, to set up to kill out the firstborn uh, and, and, and all the male uh, children. So we see this. Uh, as you pivot forward to the New Testament and the advent of Christ, right? Um, uh, Herod wants to get rid of the firstborns uh, so as to, to think that he can destroy uh, Jesus. Uh, but if, if you look in Exodus 1, the people cried out, right? The midwives that were supposed to kill these sons um, ended up finding favor with God uh, and, and, and were protected. So God begins to reintroduce himself to his people. In Exodus 2, right, uh, we see a, a, a life called out uh, by, a by Abraham, excuse me, by Moses, right? Uh, and Moses was supposed to have died, um, but God's hand, his grace, we start seeing his grace upon him. He had a death sentence out on him, even as a baby. We have death sentences upon us, even as children, right? 
uh, because the, the wages of sin is what? Is death. And so um, we're in desperate need of deliverance, desperate need of a Savior. So you, see, you can start to see these breadcrumbs that God is throwing out for us. And we talked about how there is no deliverance other than that of God, right? He is the deliverer. And so we see this in terms of, of Exodus 2. And you go through um, you go through all of Exodus 2 and you see how God takes them. And, and, and Moses' name means to lift out, right? And that's, that's prophetic in, in, in many different ways. Um, you know, in terms of they lifted him out of the reeds, gave him to Pharaoh's daughter. Um, he was raised there. Uh, but he also is lifted by God. He is lifted um, for a purpose, and he lifts his people up out of bondage and, and, and goes forth, right? Um, but in the midst of all this, he has the inclination to go and to deliver the people, but it's not by our own hands. And this is, this is a lesson that will be a continuous theme for Moses throughout uh, the Pentateuch, right? And in particular, in Exodus, it's not by his own hands, right? Zechariah uh, chapter 3 says, it's not by might, not by power, but by what? By His Holy Spirit, by God's Holy Spirit, right? We know that we are not delivered by our own hands, but yet in our minds and our actions, we go forth and we do these things, right? But in, in the beginning of, uh, well, let's go back to Exodus 2 before we close out of that real quick. Uh, so in Exodus 2, he tries to deliver his people, seeing them beaten by the Egyptians. Now remember, Moses was raised by the Egyptians. He was, he was in Pharaoh's house, so he had a place of establishment, um, but yet he felt a yearning to save the people. Right motive, wrong way of going about it. So he ended up killing a guard, and then hit the very people that he went to save, um, called them out on it, uh, and then questioned his authority. So he fled. He ran. He eventually ended up um, saving uh, some more of his people, uh, some Midianites, um, and then ends up marrying uh, his wife, and then we talk about his father-in-law there. But he's, he's content with being a shepherd on the other side there until we, we come up on Exodus 3, uh, chapter 3, and he is called out by the Lord. And, and truly, before he ever sees the burning bush that we see in Exodus 3, uh, he's truly called out. He's sanctified. He's, he's separated from the things of this world. He should have died. You and I should have died, but we're called out. We're sanctified, uh, and we're justified um, uh, by Jesus Christ, right? Uh, but here Moses is called out, right? He was saved uh, and delivered by God for a particular task and purpose. One, because God loves. Uh, and God loves, uh, loves his people. He loves Moses, or he loved Moses. Uh, but he loved them in particular and gave them a task and a purpose. And tonight we're going to talk about excuses. Tonight we're going to talk about no more excuses. So last week we talked about called out with a divine protection. So Moses could only have gotten to where he was by the grace of God, right? He was set out by the edict of Pharaoh to be destroyed, to be killed, because he was a male. He was a Hebrew male, right? Um... But but Pharaoh's daughter saw him in the reeds after he was placed in the reeds and took upon him um, and and by the grace of God was saved. He was raised in there. Uh, he was a murderer. He was he he fled. Right. God called him out. There's a lot of divine uh, protection there. Well, now God is allowing him to see what he has been ordained to do. And, and when we come uh, to verse 11. Um, this is on the heels, this is Exodus 3 and 11. This is on the heels of Moses coming to a holy place. He sees the burning bush, and a lot of us are familiar with this. He sees this, this burning bush, but yet the bush is not consumed. It's just like us. We are in a refiner's fire, but yet we are not consumed, right? He purifies us. He, he goes and he, he, he burns off those impurities, if we allow him to, right? So God introduces himself to Moses. He reintroduces himself and Moses prostrates himself before him uh, and God begins to communicate. He begins uh, to, to address Moses and gives him a task of purpose and immediately goes and puts him to work, right? Um, so he says in verse 10, this is Exodus 3 and 10, he says, Come now therefore and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, 
uh, this this becomes a daunting task. And I told you that tonight's theme, tonight's title is no more excuses. And the relevancy behind this is is that as just like with Moses, we are saved, and as great as that is, we are delivered. That is that is great. The Bible tells us that uh, heaven stops and they celebrate. Now I'm paraphrasing, but they they sing and they rejoice as one repentant sinner uh, comes um, comes through Christ back to God. That's a joyful moment, right? We all should 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 stop and pause and rejoice for that. But as great as that thing is, God has a task and purpose because His embodiment of His blessings, His salvation, His deliverance is in you. And all your imperfections are a great testimony to the world, bringing light into the world, right? Jesus Christ tells us that we are the light of the world, right? We're going forth and shining the light of His Word, the light of His glory, the light of His blessings, but most importantly, God's grace and His salvation, right? And it goes forth. That's that's the pivot for of the relevancy for us who are in Christ. For for Moses, right, this is a relationship building, this is a, a team building moment, right? Um, uh, and, and, and it starts with the one. Remember, we've talked about that God starts with the one and then he goes into the multitude. So he's reconciling his people back on to himself. So he comes to Moses and he says in verse 10, Exodus 3, verse 10, he says, Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. All right. So we're going to read from verse 11 uh, through 22, right? From 11 to 22, and we're going to circle back. So if you're with me on Google Meet, um, and, and if we can, put into the uh, Facebook uh, text there um, the, the link to, to Google Meet. Uh, if you're with me on Google Meet, you'll see that I have uh, Bible Gateway, uh, open and from left to right, my left uh, to right, I've got the New King James Version. Uh, I believe it's the New English Translation I have next, the English Standard Version, and the New Living Translation. All right. Um, so the three or the four of those uh, displayed, uh, and it, like I said, if you're on Google Meet, uh, you can see that. On, on the display there. If not, I, I challenge you to go uh, to Bible Gateway and you can open up all those translations free of charge uh, if you don't have those in a hard copy, um, all, all, all the varying translations. Or you could go to, to Bible Hub and get those, those translations all readily uh, put across as well. All those are free uh, up onto the internet there and highly encourage any of those things, uh, blue blue letter note and a couple other ones uh, are out there. There's there's a ton of resources out there where you don't have to spend uh, spend money uh, unless you want to, um, but you can follow along and, and see the varying translations there uh, to help you digest a little bit more um, of what God is trying to tell us in this season. So I'm going to read uh, Exodus 11. Uh, through 22 in a New King James Version, and then we're going to come back. We're going to circle back, and I want you to put in the back of your mind uh, of what it means to no longer have excuses and how um, we have Him at His Word. His promises keep, and that He is all that we need. All right, so starting at verse 11. Remember now, God is calling Moses out. Remember, He's calling you out upon your salvation. He's putting Moses to work right then and there. He reveals the thing, is boom. Go to work, right? Um, and, and what he's trying to tell us is he's enough, right? He saved you and he's saying he's enough, right? So follow that as we go through verses 11 through 22. So starting at verse 11, it says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Remember, you're not in this alone and it's not about you, right? Verse 12, So he said, I will certainly be with you and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought out the people of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Verse 13. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers be sent, uh, uh, has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is, your, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Verse 14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Right? God said to Moses, I am who I am. 
And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. Verse 17, And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jeb Jebusites to a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 18, They will heed your voice and you shall come uh, you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, the king of Egypt, and you are to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. Not or no, not even by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst. And after that, he will let you go. Verse 21, And I will give the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be, when you go, that you shall, go, that you shall not go empty-handed. Verse 22, But every woman shall ask of, the, ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near the house, articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. You shall plunder the Egyptians. Okay, so I kind of stumbled and bumbled through all that, but I want to go through um, and hit a couple of points. First and foremost, there are no more excuses, right? I want you to keep that from the back of your brain housing group to the forefront here. As you go through the rest of this week, there's no more excuses, right? So I want to read... Uh, one or two other things to you here real quickly. So when we look at Exodus 3, um, chapter 3, verses 11 through 22, right? Uh, it, it talks about really the emphasis from 11 to 12 is what we kind of hit on. It's called by God. And I want you, the reason why I want you to put these verses to the front of your, your, your mind, in particular, no more excuses, is because you are called by God, right? Romans 8 specifically talks about that. Um, they're, they're, they're justified, they're predestined, they're called, right? Those who would believe upon the name of Jesus, right? And that belief of Jesus is really believing that God is who he says he is, that he'll do what he says he will do. That's that faith, right? And in doing so, we receive access to him. And that's what God is doing here. He's calling Moses, he's, he's, he's taking him out of somewhat a foggy familiarity into the relationship. And that's important. Because all throughout the Bible, there might be some people that have some sort of knowledge of God, right? Um, but don't have a relationship with Him. So bridging that gap, separating, uh, He's trying to get them to separate from their bondage, to separate from the world, separate from a carnal mindset, separate from the fleshly desires, and focus on Him, right? And so He starts this with Moses having delivered him, starting with the one, revealing himself with a all-consuming fire, with, with, with what we would consider a, 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 a sign, a wonder, a miracle, a spectacle, right? Uh, that cannot be explained by mankind. So he introduces himself there, and he begins to speak, right? But there's some reverence that goes on with Moses in the preceding verses. But now he commands Moses to go forth. He puts him to work immediately. Because as he has delivered Moses, right, it's no longer just about Moses, but it's about his people. It's about bringing glory and honor to his name that his people might be blessed, right? So this is the importance of us being delivered and accepting the call of God. So 11 through 12 talks about called by God. It talks about Moses offers an excuse, right? He offers an excuse even though God delivered his uh, delivered him and will deliver his people. God has a plan, but at the time right now, God doesn't feel like it's necessary to go into all the itty bitty details. 
even though he reveals probably more than what he should have to. He gives him his credentials later on in the verses, right, uh, of who he is. Uh, he, he, he lays out, really, the Reader's Digest version of how it's going to go down. All he's telling him to do is just to walk in it, and he will deliver. But the carnal mind can't receive that, right? So this is why we must walk in God. This is why his word is important. And trusting in that word. And faithfully obeying that word. And, and, and receiving that word, right? But first and foremost, Moses offers an excuse, right? So what we'll see from Exodus uh, 3, 11 through 12. Uh, Exodus 3, 13 through 22. Exodus 4, 1 through 9. And Exodus 4, 10 through 17, Moses is going to give four excuses, right? Now, we're not going to cover all those. We're going to focus on, on 11 through 22. So we're going to go on to the first two excuses. But he's going to give four excuses. But, but how many of us know that God knows your resume before huh, you even put the application in? Now, that's a word of praise right there. He tells Jeremiah, before I formed you in a womb, I ordained you, right? I ordained you to be a prophet and, uh, before nations, right? So God knows us. He knows our, our good, our bad, our ugly, right? But he still calls. And this is a brilliant thing. This is, this is an awesome thing. Uh, if we just stay still and see the salvation of the Lord, uh, we can understand his love. And we can understand his sovereignty over all the things of this world. And if he's calling you, then he's going to equip you. And if he's equipping you, he's going to empower you. And if he's going to empower you and equip you, he's going to encourage you. Right? Asked, um, uh, asked to deliver Israel, Moses immediately protested that he was not equal to the task. Now, think about that for a second. There are gifts within the church, right? The Bible tells us that the gifts of the calling are without repentance. Or they're, they're irrevocable. But how many of us are steadily, you know, stifling the Holy Spirit in our lives, right? Um, by saying, hey, I, I, I'm not worthy. I, I don't have the ability. I, I've been there, done that. Well, you know, I, I can't do this. I can't do that. Well, of course you can't do that. God's going to do it for you. All you have to do is allow Him to take charge, right? He's never going to force it on you. But if you become that willing vessel, that living sacrifice that we see in Romans 12, right? Then, then he can use you to draw men and women onto him. Okay, so Moses immediately began to protest and be able to confess what he couldn't do, right? Um, that he was not equal to the task, but God tried to reassure him. Uh, Moses would offer three more, as we talked about. Uh, we're going to cover the, the, the second one here in a little bit. But he would offer three more excuses, and God would answer each one, giving him more than enough resources to lead the people um, and confront Pharaoh, right? Um, so, so keep that in, in the forefront of your, of your mind. And then uh, the second half of this, if this chapter, 13 and 22, was excuse number two. So the first one says, hey, I'm not qualified. How many of us say we're not qualified to walk in the righteousness of the Lord, to use the gifts which he's already deposited into us, and to proclaim the good news that his people might be delivered. So think about that. So excuse number two is, they don't know you anymore. Doesn't that sound like today's society? Well, I don't know you anymore, right? Okay, Moses protested, uh, you know, that, that, that the Israelites had wandered too far from God to take seriously God's offer to liberate them. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that in a second because I need that to marinate for a second. But, but we'll read it one more time. It says, Moses protested that the Israelites had wandered too far from God to take seriously God's offer to liberate them. God assured Moses of his identity. I am the one who, uh, who always is. I am who I am, right? Or I am, the great I am, right? And this is found... And, and 3 and 14, um, and of his ability to bring Israel out of Egypt, he told Moses in detail some of the things that would happen as he led Israel. Remember, he left, he, he, he gave just enough to, to reassure Moses. He, he gave just enough to lay out the plan to at least let him know, hey, there is a plan, right? It's the promise that Israel would lead Egypt wealthier than they came parallels Abraham's experience, right? So, so, uh, what we're alluding to there, um, when we talk about 
Abraham's experience, right? Their, 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 their patriarch, their forefather, right? Um, there was a famine, right? God promised them the land of Canaan to be the promised land where they would prosper. But there was a famine, and in their carnal uh, mindset, Abram and Sarah and, and, and Lot and, and the rest of the, their cattle and all the stuff left the land of favor, left the land of promise, and went into the land of bondage, right? They went into Egypt. So this is not the first rodeo into going into, into Egypt, right? So, but as a result, right, be it the permissive will of God or, 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 or whatnot, they went in to Egypt. They went in willingly into a land of bondage. And it was here that Abram, right, turned to his wife, who just happened to be his half-sister as well, and told her, don't present yourself as my wife, present yourself as my half-sister, because if, if you come across as my wife, surely they will kill me, right? So again, the excuses that we, descendants of Adam, right, uh, 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 in our flesh, in our carnal mindset, make not understanding who goes with us, right? Not understanding who has set this day before us, right? So, so excuses, right? Well, God has a plan. And when God's hand is upon his chosen, right, you, you, you can't take it out of it, right? The Bible tells us when he is placed in his hand, nothing and no one can take it out. So, long story short, uh, Pharaoh confesses. He says, well, hey, why didn't you tell me this was your wife and not your sister? Because God was bopping that leader upside his head. Because God's purpose was for Abram and Sarah to be man and wife, not be seen as the, uh, not seen as the sister. Because what, what would end up happening is, is that if, if that Pharaoh, if that, 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 that ruler had ended up marrying uh, Sarah, then it would have made God a liar. And we know God can't lie. So God promised the seed through Abraham and Sarah. So as they left out of Egypt, right, after they left out of that uh, potential death situation, right, um, and after they left out of that bondage situation, right, um, they left with more than what they came into. Some good, some bad, some ugly. Um, and they went back into the land of Canaan after the famine, right? So they went back into there, um, and from there, that's, that's where we get uh, Hagar and, and some more cattle and some more servants and so forth. Um, but the parallelism uh, that we have between what God is presenting, right, uh, to Moses there. So they're in a land in which they're not supposed to dwell in. That's not where the promise is. The promise is in the land of Canaan. So he's, he's, he's reminding them of his promise to remove them, right? And so, so we, we, we pivot back just a little bit as we go back into 11 and 12 here. Moses makes some excuses and says, who am I? And so last week we talked a little bit about this, that the deliverance is God alone, right? God's hand is who delivers us. And this is important because all throughout time, we use our carnal mindset with our fleshly desires to justify how we're going to get delivered. And then when we fall short, then, then we want to question some things. But God is making known that it's by his hand that he's going to pluck us uh, out of out of uh, bondage. He tells Moses here uh, that I, in verse 12, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain, right? So there are allusions to our faith as Christians here. And this is what I want you to take away from this, right? In verse 12, he talks about that he will serve. Um, this will be the sign. So Romans 10 and 9 tells us that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, right? In other words, that we believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord. Lord over everything, right? Over the good, the bad, the ugly, the small, the big, all of the things, huh? right? It says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart, that God raised him from the dead. Not our minds, but our heart, right? Our confession of faith, that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. In other words, we go from that, 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 that sinful nature of the first Adam to the second, aka the last Adam of Jesus Christ. We change, right? Pastor likes to talk about, Pastor Davis likes to talk about, we've changed partners. 
Well, in essence, we have not only changed partners, but our whole essence, our embodiment shifts, right? So when we shift those partners of self, carnality of flesh, that is doomed for eternal death, right? We take on life through Christ, right? And he deposits his spirit, which serves as that guarantee. But in that process, we have a relationship with God. This is what it means by Christ lording over us. He is to head over to church, right? In his church age, and he will come again. Um, and so when we rewind back to Moses, we see the parallels there. God had to reintroduce himself to the people, right? And Moses came up with excuse. So when we talk about us as the church, we come up with excuses all the time. The first one is, I'm not qualified. Well, of course you're not qualified, right? Less the grace of God so that no man, no woman can boast, right? It is not by works, right? So there's nothing that we can do to earn it, to afford it, or to deserve our salvation. And this is what God is proclaiming through word and through deed to the Israelites. It is by His hand that you are delivered. So there's no more excuses, right? So allow God to go to work there. This is what He's telling us in 13 and 14. So He's given His credentials. He's saying, I am who am, right? And then He talks about, as He goes down in verse 15 and 16, He tells him that He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, that the promise still stands. The promise of the covenant still stands. Okay. So as Christians, why is this relevant to us? Because the seed is not necessarily particularly the, the, um, the physical uh, heritage of those that come through the line uh, of Abraham. But those who would have faith in the seed, the seed that is Jesus Christ, that came through that lineage, right? Um, and so, being whatever walk of life, that salvation will come on to them. But it's that faith, it's that belief, right? Just like uh, God is speaking to Moses here, that the faith that God is who he says he is, that he'll do what he says he'll do, and that he'll do it for them. In particular, he's starting with the one in terms of Moses, right? Um, and just like with us, all the excuses, right? And here we're going to uh, review the first two of four, and we'll get in if the Lord says the same, uh, the, the remaining excuses. Uh, but one, I'm not qualified. So the first thing that we like to say is, well, I can't do this. Well, the Bible tells us that he's given gifts unto all men, all, unto all women. So he's given gifts unto us. And those gifts are not for us in particular, but the edification of the body, the body of the Christ. That's, that's us in this church age. But what he has done in the Old Testament is he has revealed himself to his people and given them gifts, right, that they might bring glory to his name. So, okay, where, where, where am I going with this? So he tells us in verse 17, he says, And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction, that sounds like deliverance to me, right, of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites, and the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk a honey, right? So he's taking, it, taking them out of oppression uh, and delivering them into a better state. This is what he does for us. But he says, But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. When God delivers, right? And this is, this is, this is part of my proof. This is part of my case for it's not just about you. The life that you're saving might not just be your own. Right? So when he deposits the seed of Christ into us, right, um, he makes it so that the Holy Spirit not only indwells in us, but that inward manifestation necessitates a change. So he goes in and he spiritually prunes us, uh, according to John 15, right? And he's cutting off those things uh, that will hinder us from growth, those things that, that are not right in us, right? And he prunes those things to make better that we might grow ever to, ever to more, right? But in doing so, there should be an outward manifestation, right? So James talks about faith without works is dead. So when we talk about that faith, right, that inward manifestation of God's word, the, the transfusion of blood, uh, uh, of Christ's blood, right, and the moving of the Holy Spirit within us, there should be an outward manifestation. Now, 
Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, peace, joy, right? Self-control. These are the outward manifestations of that metamorphosis, that changing of partners. When we accept Christ and receive the Spirit, we receive the indwelling Spirit, and then to boot, there's more, right? But wait, there's more. We receive a filling from the Spirit that allows us to go out and operate in those gifts, right? So God uses all these things, not just for self, but that you might go out and go get to the campus, go get to the people and go forth. So we'll build this, we'll continue to build this case. God has identified himself to Moses. He's revealed himself to Moses. He's already shown a sign, a wonder, a miracle through the burning bush and told him, hey, this is holy ground. Now he has not only done that, but he's qualified himself by saying that, hey, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I made a promise, I made a covenant to them, and I'm going to fulfill it through you to them by my works, right? Not by your power, but my works. I will go with you. So he says, uh, but I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not even uh, by a mighty hand. So it doesn't matter what Moses does. It doesn't matter what the Israelites do. It's only by the hand of God. It doesn't matter what you do in your fleshly state, in your carnal mindset. It's the grace of God that delivers and that saves. You simply have to believe, right? He says, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders which I will do in the midst. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be when you go that you shall not go out empty. Okay, so let's break that down for a minute. But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not even by a mighty hand. So not by your own hands, not by your own works, but by God, right? But salvation is his alone. Deliverance is his alone. He says, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst. And after that, he will let you go. All right. So um, uh, the importance behind verse 20, the importance behind your deliverance by grace, right? Uh, through your faith in Jesus Christ, right? The importance of this is that you serve as a living testimony. So, so like Moses, we come before and says, I can't, I can't, I can't. I, and really what you should be saying, I won't, I won't, I won't. All right? So can't is basically saying that my physical limitations cannot go here. But a yielded heart, a yielded soul to Christ allows you to receive what God has already asked you and commanded you to do. Because rest assured, he's not going to tell you to go do something if he himself has not already given you the ability to do it, right? So, so, so the importance behind you going forth and telling it on a mountain, telling it behind closed doors, telling it in open forms, or whatever it is that God has called you to do, is because whether they receive it or not, God's glory will manifest on this earth, right? So Moses was sent in multiple fold. He was sent in to reestablish re, uh, re that relationship with God, right? With his chosen people. He was sent in to show his might amongst the world, which is represented here in Egypt, and also to show his might of his salvation, his grace and his mercy to the Israelites, right? So, so in doing so, in their salvation, in their deliverance, the world would know there is no other God like our God, like Jehovah, like Yahweh, right? There is no other God. There might somebody, be some other folks to profess to be God, but as we will see in Exodus, he smites all of them down. He discredits all of them so that the Israelites will know and rest assured that theirs is the one and true God. So there is no more excuse, right? So he builds that relationship, that foundation of trust that their faith might be built, right? So when we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we have a sign in terms of the cross of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And to see just as Moses would go in to deliver the Israelites, right? And give them the signs, wonders, and miracles of God, um, that they might yet believe and that the world would know and stand uh, notice this 
is what God is showing us. So excuse one, uh, I, I, I'm not qualified. Excuse two, the people will not remember, right? Are you given excuse one when the Lord tells you to go out to witness uh, and, and, and to go out? Because he has commanded us, right? In, in, in Mark 16, he says, go out into all the world and make disciples of all nations, right? Uh, so he has commissioned us to go forth in the name of Jesus, to go forth with the Holy Spirit, right? With his word, to proclaim the good news, the gospel of grace, the gospel of salvation, so that all might have the opportunity to receive the salvation of the Lord, to receive that deliverance. This is what he commanded Moses, to go. I'm telling you to go, to go and to speak my words. And these are my credentials. The God of I, uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the I am has sent you. He gives them threefold their credentials. I am. I am who am, right? Um, and and the, the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, we, we have the credentials of the indwelling Holy Spirit to go for. But are we using the excuse that I'm not qualified? Well, God puts that to bed. Of course you're not qualified. But just like he told Moses, he says, I will go with you, right? I will go with you. And just like he tells us in Ephesians, right? He says, stand firm, right? And Jesus, Jesus will go and fight the battle for us. And spoiler, he's already won, right? So, so all we have to do is stand still, stand firm in the faith, right? So excuse number two is uh, they, they've moved so far away, they won't remember who it is. Well, okay, give him who God is, right? Give whoever it is who God is. And for us, have you, do you know uh, Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And just start to, to witness to them about the greatness and the goodness and the, and the love and the mercy. So even if they are not converted, right? Not equipped in power and courage, you have planted the seed. But the time for excuses is over. And this is basically what Moses is being told by God, right? And God, this is what we should all love about God, is very patient. Uh, he is very patient because not only has he delivered Moses from a certain death, not once but twice, and will continue to deal with him, um, but, Mo but he's, he's revealing to Moses uh, his credentials. Now, now that's, that's pretty impressive. The God who created all the earth and the heavens and, and all points in between, he is giving Moses his credentials, right? Uh, Moses is steadily trying to get out of things. You ever try to get out of things? I have. Right? You ever you ever try to walk away from things? I have. Right? Things might seem daunting. Things things might seem uh, a little overwhelming. But God goes back. Re remember what He tells Him in, in in verse twelve here. Right? As as we scroll back up, He says, uh, Moses in verse eleven says, but <laughs> but Moses said to God, Who am I? Right? Uh, we say that on a daily basis, if not verbally, outwardly with our emotion, uh, with, uh, with our actions, if not inwardly through our emotions and through our thoughts. Um, it says, but, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt, right? Um, so verse 12, he says, this is God's response. So he said, I will certainly be with you, Right? I will certainly be with you. Do you believe that he's with you? Because Romans 8 tells us that if God is for us, who can be with us? Uh, who can be against us, right? And he says, and this shall be a sign to you, right? He has given us signs, wonders, and miracles that if God is for us, who can be against us? And if you go down further, uh, down into Romans 8 and 37, he talks about that I am persuaded certain translations, I am convinced, in other translations, I am persuaded, I am convinced. In other words, if you're speaking in, in modern vernacular, I'm sold out that, 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 that heaven and, and earth, angels and principalities, all these things that he talks about. He, he lists the whole gamut and all things in between. I'm paraphrasing now, of course. Um, but, but the bottom line is, he says no excuses. He's saying that none of these things will separate us from our Lord Jesus Christ, the love that is God, that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing will separate them unless you choose to separate yourself. But there are no more excuses. And this is what, what Moses is, is showing to him and showing to him the severity of the call. 
Because the life that he's saving is not just his own. The life he is saving today is not just your own. And there is a sense of urgency here. And this is the last thing that we're going to talk about here. This is how good God is, right? So, so not only does he deliver, right? He delivered, but he increased uh, their name. He increased their wealth coming out uh, of bondage. This is the plight of those in which God has chosen and which those that have been chosen to accept this name, right? So what do I mean by chosen? Those that have chosen. He has chosen from time of old, right? That those that will call upon the name of his son, Jesus Christ, right? Those who would elect to call upon the name um, would be saved, right? Um, so that's not saying that he, he sat, you know, a gazillion years ago and said that Smith isn't going to be saying this and that, but he set aside that those who would call upon the name of Jesus, those who would believe upon that, uh, would be reconciled back onto him. And that's a, that's a, that's a pretty, pretty um, powerful thing, that he loves us enough that he would set a road to redemption, a path to salvation, and that road to redemption is Jesus Christ. He redeemed all of creation back onto him, right? By, by going to the cross and shedding the blood. We're, we're justified uh, by grace through our faith in the shedding of that blood, but ultimately the grace of God, right? And we have access to the grace of God by electing to go forth and to believe, right? Uh, by, to believe that, that Jesus is enough. So how about you today? Are we putting aside the excuses? Are we needing another uh, two excuses to be explained, uh, be explained uh, like Moses, right? Um, but, but, but does he have us at, I am your Lord, I'm, I am your God, right? Um, on the road to, the, to Damascus, Saul encounters a great light. Not unlike Moses, seeing this all-encompassing and, and, and burning bush that is not consumed, right? That he bears witness to a light, Saul does. And, and, and Saul definitely not necessarily qualified for this because he was a persecutor of the church, as are, were some of us before we came to Christ, right? But this, he witnessed this great light. He had an encounter with Christ and was never the same after that, right? He gave up his life so that he might have a life in and through Christ. How about us? He, uh, he chose, he willingly chose uh, to believe in a resurrected Lord, right? The redeeming um, blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, that he might have a renewed relationship with God. Um, and we could talk forever about how he had a, um, a familiarity with God, but did not have a relationship. Moses was being called to go do something for God's people. How about you? Each and every one of us has a gift if not multiple gifts. Um, and in this season in which we exchange gifts, will, are we really telling God that we are willing to reject the gifts in which he has placed inside of us that not only enhance our lives, right, uh, but can bring others to the greatest gift ever known to man or woman, and that's the gift of salvation. All right, so we are going to go into, pray, uh, into prayer uh, remember, we're called out with divine protection. That was last week's. Um, and that was, if you, you missed it, you can go up on either YouTube or you can go up on here on, on Facebook uh, Live and check that out. That was chapter Exodus chapter 3, 1 through 11. Uh, and we recapped a little bit of 11 and 12 uh, tonight. But tonight we talked about no more excuses. And that's really part one. Because remember, we've got two more excuses. We went over the first two. That, hey, one, I'm not qualified. Two, um, they won't, they're, they're so far gone, they wouldn't receive, right? So, unless the Lord says something differently, we'll come back with part two, um, and um, we'll, we'll go into those, but uh, we're putting away the excuses. All right, so no more excuses, and pray to the Lord Jesus that he might right-size and circumcise your heart, that you might receive him. All his equipping, all his empowering, all his encouraging. Allow the Spirit to guide you in all the ways that you might go, right? So, Heavenly Father, we thank you now for the victory that is your love, Father God, that is your grace, that is your mercy, that is your peace. 
We thank you now for your touch upon our hearts, resuscitating it, Father God, that we may no longer long for self or long for the world, but, Father God, long for you. And, Father God, as we press, Father God, as we, as we stretch our faith, Father God, as we exercise our faith, Father God, we know that you are faithful, Father God, and worthy of all praise, all glory, all honor, Father God. So, Father God, as you impart your light into us through your word, Father God, as you make us your vessels, Father God, of grace and a peace, Father God, let us shine, Father God. Let us put on the high beams today, Father God, that in this season we might present the greatest present ever known to this world, Father God, and that is your salvation by grace through faith, Father God. Let us be emboldened through your words, Father God, and speak your heavenly words, Father God, that a whole world, Father God, saved and unsaved, might know that you are a merciful God, you are a graceful God, you are a loving God, Father God, you are a storing God, Father God. So let us give the, the gift of salvation, not through our own works, not through our own righteousness, but Father God, Father God, for those, that, Father God, that would elect, those who would choose to call upon the name of Jesus, Father God. We believe by faith, Father God, that your grace is still in the saving business, Father God. And it's still in the redeeming business, Father God. It's still in the reconciling business, Father God. For you have justified those who would believe that you are who you say you are and that you will do what you say you will do, Father God. So we're speaking to the souls tonight, Father God, knowing that we have a choice, Father God. Knowing that if we have not called upon your name, Father God, and knowing that if we have not chosen to follow the Lord Jesus, Father God, knowing that if we haven't done these things, that all we need to do, according to Romans 10 and 9, is to call upon your holy name, Father God, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that you, Father God, have raised him from the dead, they shall be saved. Now, Father God, we're speaking to that one, Father God, much less the multitudes, Father God, that doesn't know you tonight, Father God, and we're speaking to those that do know you, Father God, that will carry your word to, Father God, to all the byways, the highways, and all places in between, Father God. Becoming a living testimony, being that light bearer, to shine your light, Father God, that in this season we give the present of life, Father God, in and through you, Father God. Now we know, Father God, that we have no expectation or right to ask you anything, but, Father God, we ask that the seed be planted, Father God, in and through us, Father God that your righteousness might dwell in us, Father God, by grace, through faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace and be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen.